Good morning. Welcome to North Baptist. It's a good day to be here, to be able to worship the one true and living creator God of the universe uh, in, as, as a corporate group. It's also a good day because we don't have to bundle up and go out and shovel snow, but we don't have to sweat mowing lawn either. So <laughs> kind of right there in the middle, huh? So if, if you would, please stand and join me and singing hymn number 149, Praise Him, Praise Him. We're going to move this right along. again let's open this uh, service in prayer dear heavenly father thank you for this day that you bless us with lord we thank you for the weather we thank you for the rain lord we praise you that we are able to be here in your house today i thank you for all those who are pray that you'd be with those who aren't that you'd keep them safe whether they be traveling or wherever they may be pray lord that you'd be with the service that you'd be with the pastor that you would give him the words to say that you'd have all of us to have open hearts and open ears to whatever it is you have for us this morning lord i pray that uh, everything done here is honoring and glorifying to you in your name we pray amen you may be seated. For our next song, we're going to sing Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. It's number 502 in the hymnal, or it'll be on the screen for us here.
fourth verse, I want us to change the uh, course just a little bit. I want us to personalize it. Instead of saying, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, I want to sing, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you. And so we're going to make him into you, and at the end, oh, for grace to trust you more. Okay? So let's sing the fourth verse with these changes to the chorus. I'm so glad I learned to trust you. Thank you for that choir. I uh, welcome again to North Baptist Church. If you happen to be a first time visitor, uh, if you please fill out a visitor card, they should be in the seat right in front of you and drop them in the offering plate as it passes in just a few moments. Uh, we have quite a few announcements, so we're gonna get through them here quickly, hopefully. Uh, but first one being, if you've not yet received your missionary card, um, please do so, it is the folks. Uh, they are missionaries to Salt Lake City, Utah, right here in the United States. Uh, so kind of a unique one, so please um, do so. Add that to your ring <clears throat> and keep the rest of them in your prayers. Uh, moving in succession kind of as in time. Um, tonight, if you are a part of any of the committees or any of the meetings that you need to be at, uh, the young leaders will be meeting at 4.30, so make sure you're here for that. 
also choir practice at 5. So again, please be here for that as they are practicing uh, for the Christmas, um, Christmas, Easter cantata or however we want to call it. Um, but next Sunday, so please be here for that. Uh, also come tonight, obviously just to come, but we'll be having our monthly business meeting directly after the service. Uh, so you won't want to miss that. You want to be a part of that. Also, if you're a member of the choir or would like to sing in the choir, um, again, come tonight. But also there's going to be a special practice on Saturday at 9 o'clock. Um, so if you're part of the choir, please be here at Saturday, 9 o'clock in the morning to practice um, and rehearse for that Easter cantata. Um, also, if you're part of the narration for that um, program next Sunday, uh, you don't need to be here till about 9.45, um, and then we'll run through it all and read our parts and everything of that nature. So if you have anything to do with that, please be here Saturday, 9 or 9.45, um, depending on what you're doing. The ladies are planning a day trip uh, Wednesday, May 8th to Pride and Country in Saginaw. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know what that is. I think it's like a giant Chipshuana type thing, if I'm not mistaken. Um, village. It's a village. I was wrong. <laughs> village. Thank you, Linda. Linda is kind of the mastermind behind this. Um, so it's a lot of shopping, I guess. I'm not into that kind of stuff, but most of you ladies probably are. Um, so if you'd like to go to that, the bus will be leaving here at 9.15. Um, it'll be returning about 3.30. Um, that is Wednesday, May the 8th. So if you want to come shop at the Village, um, Pride and Country, uh, please do so. But there is a sign-up sheet out there if you could sign up for it just so they um, can say, hey, you know, the bus is leaving at 9.15, but so-and-so is not here yet so they can get in touch with you um, and make sure they don't leave you behind. Also, not next Sunday, because next Sunday is Easter, so please be here for that, obviously. Um, there will be no evening service next week, uh, but we'll have a nice, uh, great service, great time of blessing, um, thanking the Lord for everything he's done next Sunday. So please be here for that. But then the following Sunday, um, April 28th, uh, Ben Stilwell will be back. He will be doing all the music and everything of that nature in the morning service, kind of like he did last time, and then speaking in the evening. Um, and this is his way of candidating for the um, choir director and associate pastor position. Uh, so don't miss that. Uh, that is April the 28th. Please be here morning and evening. He'll be speaking in the evening um, and also doing all the music throughout the day. So please, again, be here for that. There's going to be a special work day Saturday morning, May the 4th. Um, now, if you're a Star Wars fan, you know what that is. I'm not a Star Wars fan, but I still know what it is. But May the 4th, we will be having a special work day here at the church from 9 to 12, so 9 to 12 in the morning. Um, we'll be doing some stuff indoors as well as outdoors, making the church look very nice, very good for the upcoming summer and spring seasons, um, and just more pretty building, if you will, um, at that time. So please come join us there. Um, and then Sunday, May the 5th, okay, I know this is a lot, but you all have a bulletin so we can read it throughout the weeks. But May 5th is when we'll be actually voting for Ben Stilwell and Jen um, on whether or not we want them to come join us um, and join our ministry here. Uh, so don't miss that one either. We'll be voting in the evening, um, Sunday, May 5th. So again, they'll candidate the 28th and we'll vote May 5th and announce it in between. On um, the Ladies Spring Luncheon, again, um, it's not till May 11th, but that actually seems like right around the corner, and it is. It's pretty quick. Um, so Sunday, Saturday, May 11th is the Ladies Spring Luncheon at 12 o'clock. Again, tickets are on sale at the Welcome Center, so please do so. Invite your friends, bring some friends. Um, I know they would appreciate it. Also in May, we'll be having our annual voting for officials, if you will. Um, so the ballot is out there at the Welcome Center on the bulletin board, uh, if you'd like to know who's a part of that. Uh, men, if you'd come forward at this time to take our or uh, morning offering. If there are any um, kids left in here, they can make their way back to their uh, classroom after we sing the first verse of the next song. Bob Buckley, would you uh, bless our morning offering?
Thank you, Joyce. That was a beautiful offertory. Before the pastor comes and before we have a special before that, uh, let's stand and sing all glory, laud, and honor. It's number 222 in your hymnal if you'd like to use a hymnal.
Thank you for that, Brother Tim. That was a blessing, wasn't it? Someday he's going to stand up there and he is going to toot that horn and the skies will open up and we're all going to go up together. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Please turn to the book of John chapter 4. John chapter 4. I want to tell you a story. Now, on the surface, you would probably think that these two stories, the one in John 4 and this story I'm about to tell you, have any relationship. And I guess on the surface, that would be right. They, they really don't have anything to do with the other. But there is a connection. There is a relationship that I think you ought to know about. Our text here is in John chapter 4. You know, we've been talking about biblical stewardship. And automatically, people's minds goes to money and giving. Well, that is a part of it, but that's not what we've been dealing with. I've, I've been trying to emphasize and focus the underlying truths and principles of stewardship, whatever area of life it involves. It, it could be stewardship of, of your family life, stewardship of parenting, stewardship Good management of you on the job, being a good steward at your job, be, being a good father, mother, uh, being a good neighbor, being wise with your finances, how you spend, your spending habits and behavior. A lot of things about your behavior. But also your, your stewardship as you stand in relation to the Lord. Well, there is a story I want to tell you about a lady named Bertha. Now this story is over 44 years old. This incident that happened in Bertha's life took place March 30th, 1975. Now Bertha Adams had a problem. I don't know that she was really fully aware that she had a serious problem. And of course, till she died. She died on March 30th, 1975. Now here's what, when they found out about her death, uh, there was no indication that she had any family. Don't know for sure. I believe it's been many years ago that I, uh, that I first read the story, and I, I'm not sure, I think it took place around the Boston area, somewhere over in that area maybe, which isn't important. I'm not sure if she lived in a small little house or a, just a little apartment. She did have humble means, that's for sure. But whoever it was that was alerted to the fact that there was no response from her, they went into her dwelling there and they found some things very disturbing. First of all, they realized automatically that she literally starved to death. She died of malnutrition. She was found there dead in her dwelling place. There was no heat. There was no food. In fact, there was a number of other basic necessities of life. I'm not talking about anything extravagant. I'm just talking about those things that are just the bare basic necessities of life. She was completely without. Well, as they went through her things, then they found some keys. They found two different keys to some safety deposit boxes. So they went to the bank, got permission through the courts, got in there, got into the safety deposit boxes. Do you know what they found? One of those safety deposit boxes had $799,000 in cash in one of those safety deposit boxes. But in addition to that, they found hundreds of other valuables, valuable and negotiable stock certificates, bonds, other valuable certificates that um, were obviously uh, worth quite a bit and negotiable as well. They were there. Now, you think, how could someone that really was better than what you might call a millionaire. When you think about what her assets were, the money, the, the stocks, you know, no telling what that was worth. I mean, here's a lady that was probably considered, well, I would consider her a millionaire. Um, 
I bet most of us hardly consider ourselves a hundred heir, let alone a millionaire, you know, to, to think about having that kind of money. But here she was. Now, now you probably are very bothered by this story is how could Bertha Adams be in such a situation and yet possess so much? Well, Bertha had a problem. That's for sure. But in light of what they found in relation to her condition at death, Bertha Adams definitely, I don't think, was aware of the problem that she faced. To be fair, not to be facetious and ugly in any way, I'm afraid that was Bertha's fault. Nobody else's fault. They say, well, neighbor should have checked on her. No, that was not the problem. Neighbor should have. If she had family, family should have taken care of her. And I, and I think this ought to illustrate to us how careful we need to be with, with our family. Don't ever isolate yourself so much to the point that you don't think you need family. You need family. We all need one another. And if you don't have family anybody nearby, you've got church family, and you need to utilize that. And shame on you if you don't. That's being a poor steward. But that wasn't Bertha's problem. That's not what killed her. What killed Bertha was Bertha. There was no need for her to die of malnutrition, to starve. There was no need for her not to have heat, other basic necessities, water. I mean, just for the daily cleansings a person would need. I mean, that's pretty pathetic, isn't it? So now, once you begin to learn about this, you, you, you know, you're not, you don't feel quite as sympathetic. I don't, I don't feel that sympathetic towards Bertha now than I did when I first started reading the story, you know. Because there are some things that were certainly inexcusable. Well, what was, what do you think was Bertha's problem? Well, I'll tell you. Bertha had a stewardship problem. Bertha had no understanding of the use and reason that we have possessions and resources. We have been given an opportunity to be stewards of this earth. And I grant we could do a lot better job. And I can grant through history there's been a lot of abuses through that. You and I both know that. But God gave us the responsibility to be stewards of this earth. We have dominion. And the resources that God has put here on earth for us, we are to manage and utilize for man's good. Why do you think God spent seven days? Actually, if you think about it, maybe more like five, maybe six. But all of the prior five days of creation was preparing a proper home for man. And man was last because man was the crowning glory of God's creation. And that means that when God gave Adam and us that responsibility, he endued the earth with the resources, now utilize them. Now they can't abuse, but just because something is abused doesn't mean it's bad. I'm for renewable energy. I'm for, I'm for solar energy. I'm for wind energy. Goodness knows, I think all of us here lately, if we'd have had a windmill out in our yards, we could have generated our own electricity with the wind. Out there on the, te the Texas Plains, up in the Panhandle where we lived there in Perryton, my goodness, there, there was nothing to break the wind. Certainly when it blew from the south from the feedlots. Oh, I tell you what, you talk about a nice sweet perfume that would just saturate the town. I got to where, man, I enjoy it. It didn't, didn't, didn't bother me. I'd go to a big city and it was... It, it was horrible, all the pollution. But hey, the wind, yeah, I'm for those things, but I'm also for fossil energy. That's what God put it here for. I'm for being good management of our trees. You know? But why do you think they're here? You see, we're failing to understand the proper use and means and reason why God's given us resources. Do you see that? And here Bertha had the resources, the possessions here, but she somehow thought different. She thought that the possessions that she had should be saved and hoarded. Well, let me ask you guys that are retired, why did you save your money? 
Did you save your money so then at the end you can have a big bank account and then when you die, look, look how much money I... Did you save and put back for retirement for that reason? No, you did not. Why did you save for retirement? You saved for retirement so you can spend it. Why do you go earn money at a job so you can spend it? Well, I, you don't, you, don't you, shouldn't you save? Yes, you should save. You should save your money. You should be... A, but I'm not talking about Dave Ramsey's or Larry Burkett's programs of financial management. We're going to talk about some important areas of stewardship and wise money management later. I've got four distinct sermons that I've set up to do that, but that's going to be later on. What I'm trying to impress upon us is some important principal truths from Scripture about what stewardship really is and how this fits in with my relation to God. Do you see that? It is how we are relating to God. Bertha had a bad relationship with her possessions, didn't she? God doesn't give us stuff so we can save and hoard. Yeah, we save up for a particular reason, but why are you saving it? You're saving it to spend it. I put some money aside. I had some money saved aside, but then I spent it. Why? Because everybody said I had to have a snowblower. So I got a snowblower. And wouldn't you know it, as soon as I get it, man, the weather's great, didn't have to use it. <laughs> See, I got a little money set aside, I'm going to go buy a push mower. I got a nice ride mower, but I, got, I need a little push mower to get in areas I can't. See, why, why do you say, what's the money for? The money is to utilize, to provide a living. Now, if you look at your money in, uh, with the idea of it being filthy lucre, and you don't need it or you don't want it, then you give me your filthy lucre. I'll take it and I'll use it. See? But why? Why do we do that? To use. God, God never gave us any resources to hoard or to just put aside to do nothing with. And let me tell you something else. God's given us rich spiritual resources. Did you know that? And one of those resources is right here in this church this church building, this structure, and many other church structures all across the country. Resources that God has given the New Testament church in order for us to have the basic essentials and resources to grow and thrive. And here was this lady with all of this and she wasn't growing or thriving. She thought if she just saved it and just hoarded it, her wrong view of stewardship eventually cost her her life. Now, folks, wouldn't you say that's a sad story? Well, then I would say that Bertha needed a reality check, don't you think? Somebody should have done something, said something to her and helped her. Say what? I remember a job I had in Bible college way back in the in the early 70s. And I and I worked somewhat at a at a quick 7-Eleven store on the midnight shift on Saturday night so I could have Sunday off to go to church and there was this guy that looked like an old homeless hobo uh, and he would he would buy a bottle of pop and he would stand right there and he would drink it and I mean even when the thing was empty, empty he would keep it to make sure every little drop and then he'd make sure he put that pop. I know a lot of you guys have no idea what a, a, a bottle of pop that has a deposit on it. He wanted to make sure he got his deposit back. So he, he stood right there and did it. Well, someone told me, he said, you know who that guy is? That's guy, one of the wealthiest men in Springfield, Missouri. You might call him an industrial man. Well, he was retired. Boy, he had money. But he lived terrible. And I'm thinking, there's no reason for that. There's no reason for any of us to look like paupers. I've got a lot of wealth in Christ. Now, I may not have a lot of material means, and I may not have a lot of money. I may not make a lot. I make what I make just like you, and I'm grateful to the Lord. But the Lord gave me a responsibility to be a steward. The Lord gave me a responsibility when he gave me three wonderful children, not to hoard to myself, but to raise so that they could go forth to grow and serve him as well. That's being a good steward, don't you think? God never intended for our kids to stay around and live off of us for the rest of our lives. That's not the, that's not the program. Read the Bible and it'll tell you that. 
It's simple enough. She needed a reality. Let me tell you two things. Let me tell you. Bertha, number one, needed a right understanding of possessions. Don't you think? She needed to have a right understanding of possessions and how they were to be used. Well, you could tell she didn't have a very healthy perspective on the relationship she had with her resources and her assets of the responsibility that's given to Bertha, all of her valuables, all, all of, I don't care whether she inherited it, given to her, or she earned it, didn't matter. She had it, was in her possessions to do. All of that, that carries an important responsibility. Stewardship's that way. But let me tell you something else she needed. Not only did she need a right understanding, but she needed to have her thinking changed. It's what one guy said, you know, you need to quit this stinking thinking. You're going to have to learn to think of things. Different. You're going to have to learn if you're going to get the most out of life and the most out of your Christian walk and experience with Christ, you're going to have to learn to think different. Don't you think if we understood this simple pr principle, God is the owner of everything. You are not the owner of your house. You say, well, it's paid off. It's in my name. No, God's the one that owns it. God's the one that gave it. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God owns everything in this entire universe. And God owns you. He is your sovereign Lord. He is the possessor of heaven and earth. He's the one that's got the rights to control. He's the one that gave you life and he can take your life away. God is the ultimate steward, but he's given to us things that we can use for his glory and his honor. God is the owner of it. Do, do you not think that some people act like this church belongs to them? I remember back my great granddaddy put the nails in this. And look at the end of the pew, there's a nameplate. Donated and given in honor, that's my pew. No, it's not your pew. Those nice seats, those aren't your seats. They belong to God. They were purchased at a price and given to use for us to come together to worship. God's the owner of it. God owns everything and God's the possessor of everything and he's the possessor of you too. Now, don't you think that would really change things if people would take that outlook, that perspective I think if they did, I think church attendance would be a lot better because you're realizing that this is not just some kind of optional program God's given us. This is not optional. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. So you see, we gotta have some change in our thinking. Let me tell you, if she could have just had good understanding of what her resources were to do and how to use them, if she had her thinking changed, I think that could have saved Bertha's life. Well, now, let's look at this lady in John chapter 4. Now, the Lord was with the disciples, okay? Well, the Pharisees, they started criticizing the Lord. And they couldn't stand the fact that Jesus was baptizing more disciples than John. See, the Pharisees had no problem with John, really, up to a point. But they had no problem because John kind of represented the last of the Old Testament prophets that were to come. And he announced the coming of the Messiah. Well, they were all for that. So they were glad when John baptized his disciples. Well, now Jesus comes along claiming to be God, claiming to be the Messiah, the Savior. And they didn't like that. And they rejected him because they accused him of blasphemy. Even though it says here early in the text, Jesus himself did not baptize only his disciples. That's all. But that's the word. That's the word that usually goes around. Now watch this. Watch this. <clears throat> the Lord then, verse 4, in John chapter 4, verse 4, he said, I, you know, I need to go through Samaria, but I'm on my way to Galilee. Let's go to Galilee. But you know, to do that, I wanna, we need to go through Samaria. Now, you have to understand here that for the most part, Jews would not go through Samaria. 
I don't care if it took them a lot longer and days longer. They would go around. They would not go through Samaria. Well, you know why? Because the Samaritans were half-breeds. They really were. They were half Jew, half Gentile. Kind of the, the remnant, some sort of sick remnant from the northern kingdom that intermixed with many other peoples and many other religions. And so they come down to this point here that they're Jew, but they're also Gentile. And no Jew would have anything to do with the Samaritan. But notice that Jesus said, I've got to go through Samaria. I'm going. It's needful for me. When I read that yesterday, I, 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 I think of times when I go out shopping with Susan. Now, we went shopping a little bit yesterday. She got her something nice for Easter. I told her to. And she said, you need to do something to it. I said, okay. So we went out. Well, it didn't take long, and I was done. I said, they don't have anything I need. So Susan very gently and patiently reminds me, you have to look for things and dig for things. Oh, I figured if what I needed and my size was not there, they didn't have it, and I wasn't going to dig through that pile of pants or shirts just to find it. You know. I, that, see, that's something I don't need to do. If it's there, I'm ready to buy it. Now, if it's tools, if it's the hardware store, if it's books, I can spend a lot of time, say. And Susan says, I need to go to Kohl's today, or I need to go. Why do you need? Well, because there's a sale on, and I've got to get this such and such item for the grandkids. Well, this was Jesus. No, I've got something there that demands my attention, and then I go but to go to Galilee, I'm, I've got to go through Samaria first. So they come in verse 5 to a city of Samaria called Sychar. It was right near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, therefore, was being wearied. He was tired from all, exhausted from everything that went on that day with his journey. He sat thus on the well. Now, that's, an, that's something to note because that phrase indicates that Jesus was sitting there purposely. There was a reason. He wanted to make himself available to a woman, somewhat like Bertha, that was going to come along. Well, the other disciples, it tells us later, they had gone into town to find something to eat. So he sat thus on the well. It was about the sixth hour. That's noon for the Jews. The time of day started at 6 a.m. That was the first hour of the day. That's the way they did it, 6 a.m. to 6 a.m. That's how they did their 24-hour cycle. So when it says that Jesus wants on the cross there and it got dark about the ninth hour of the day, that was 3 in the afternoon. Now, I know some versions may say it was about 6 in the evening. That's not correct. It's noon. That's the sixth hour of the day, noon. So it was at noontime. Well, there comes this woman, verse 7, of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, spoke to her. Now, now, again, there's something important to note there because Jews, not only do they not go to the Samaria, they do not have anything to do with the Samaritans. And they don't talk to them. But he did. He said, Jesus said unto her, give me to drink. Now look at verse 9. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, well, how is it that thou, you, being a Jew, is asking me to draw you water? I, I'm a woman of Samaria. For the Jews, well, you know they have no dealings with the Samaritans. And so then Jesus, now Jesus, do you see how she's thinking? How is she thinking? She's thinking the way everybody thinks. Well, everybody thinks this, then it must be so. Is that right? Now listen carefully. She said, look, you guys have no dealings with us. Now, Jesus is trying to challenge this. He's going to challenge her thinking. He's going to hopefully help her to think different. He wants to help. He wants to help her avoid Bertha's problem. Because Bertha's problem was, of course, eventually death. And he knows what's in store for that woman if her thinking and if her lifestyle doesn't change. But to do that, he's got to persuade her. And that means he's got to get into her mind and try to change the way that she processes information. See, 
He's trying to change her perspective, her viewpoint. So he said unto her, verse 10, if thou knewest, oh, he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's talking to you right now and says to you, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him. You would have asked me, oh, I need drink. And I would have given you living water. Now, wait a minute. What is the gift of God? The, how you find out what he means by the gift of God is by the last sentence. In other words, right there in that setting, in that little, those clauses joined together, he helps identify what the gift of God is. What is it? The gift of God is living water. Well, okay. How do I know that that has anything to do with God's gift. Well, because it's living. That means, see, he's, he's telling her something that's opposite, opposite of what is the accepted norm, the accepted way to think, okay? He's challenging that, this living water, but I know it to be eternal life. Now, how else do I know that? Because as I read through the story, it's clear that what he wants to give her is this eternal life, living water that just sprouts, springs up eternally in you. But see, it's not just that. Not just the fact of what this living water represents, but he talks to him about himself being the Messiah. And, and she opened the door to that discussion when she said, well, we know, we're all looking for the Messiah and he's gonna tell us everything. So when you put all of those elements in the story together, then you can go back and say, ah, the gift of God, God's gift of eternal life that's going to be through only the Messiah, which is going to be of the Jews. So I come to that conclusion, but because you read this, you put those elements in the story, and when you carefully diagram all of this, those clauses all work together to show God is giving her the gift of eternal life of salvation through him. But he doesn't say all that at first because he's got to challenge her thinking and understanding. So verse 11, the woman said unto her, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. From whence then do you have this living water? Now, do you see? Let me ask you, has she changed her thinking? No, not yet. Do you think she understands? No, because she's still thinking in the physical, the temporal, the carnal, the earthly, worldly view. She's not thinking in terms that he's thinking, but he's getting her there. Wait a minute. You don't have anything. How can you do that? Oh, and then she opens the door a little bit more because, see, she's confused. She says in verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob? Okay, now instantly, this is Jesus' opportunity to go a little bit deeper to change your thinking. Are you greater than our father Jacob? Now, what does she mean by that? Well, that term, greater, well, it's used in a lot of different ways, okay? It predicates something about a person. She was affirming something here, asserting something. And when you do that, that term greater is trying to affirm something that this person has greater rank than another person. Are you of greater rank? Are you superior to our father, our patriarch, Jacob? Do you see that? See? Now, that term greater is also used in relation to affirm something about God. In other words, she says greater... Are you more eminent in your power and authority than our patriarch Jacob? See, that's what she's intimating at. Okay, okay, then let's say it this way. Are you of greater authority and power than God? Because to be greater than Father Jacob would mean 
two things. It means that you outrank him, which could only be God. And that also means, number two, that you had to exist before Jacob. See, it's a term of those who surpass others in their nature and power. Now, how else do I know that? Well, would you go for just a moment to John chapter 10? Look at John chapter 10 with me. Look at verse 29. Well, actually, back up earlier in the text when they were at Jerusalem and it was at the Feast of Dedication and Jesus walked there into the temple. Well, the Jews came around him and they said, well, come on, Jesus, how long are you going to make us keep doubting and questioning and wonder, are you the Messiah or not? If you are the Christ, would you just tell us the truth? Tell us plainly. So Jesus in verse 25 said, I told you, I told you plainly that I want, but you still don't. You willingly refuse. In other words, it's not that they didn't have the faculty. They just refused. They already made a decision to reject him. You didn't believe me. And, and the, works that, the works that I'm doing, I'm doing in my father's name. That was a mark of the Messiah. He would do the works of God. The Old Testament prophet said that would mark the Messiah, the true Messiah and Savior is being one that would work, God work God's works. And they bear witness to me. But you still don't believe me because you're not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. They accept and receive what I'm saying. And I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them, watch verse 28, eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father which gave them me is, there's that term, greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. And you know what? I and my father are one. And then the Jews took up stones to stone him to kill him. Why? Wait a minute. You stoning me for the good works? No, we're fine. You did all those good things and those miracles. That's fine. We're going to kill you because you're making yourself equal with God. So that's what this says. Now, back in chapter 4, uh, here when she says, Are you greater than our father Jacob? Are you more excellent in person, in power, and authority than all of the patriarchs? Well, if you're saying that, if, then you must be saying that you're God. Are you more highly exalted than our patriarch Jacob? Uh, she says, are you telling me that you existed before Jacob? Oh. Oh. Now, you see how slowly the Lord's change in her thinking. He's slowly helping her come to the point where she can accept the truth of who he is. If she does that, she can accept and understand what he's trying to tell her about this living water. Are you greater than, why, well, he watered his cattle here. Look at verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. But I'm going to tell you something here. Look at verse 14. If you drink of the water that I give you, you'll never thirst again. Because that water that I shall give you will be in you a well of water springing up into everlasting life. See, there again, that's that gift of God. That's why we know it is the eternal gift of salvation only through Jesus. The woman then said to him in verse 15, Sir, give me this water. Now, now she's thinking different. She, ah, that's it. That's it. Hey, I want some of this water that, that I won't ever thirst again and I won't have to keep coming back. Well, now she's not there yet. She's still kind of thinking on that earthly level. She's not got it yet, but she's getting close. Jesus said, great, I'll do that. Go call your husband. Well, oh, I don't have a husband. He says, you're right, you don't. The man you're with now is not your husband, but you've had five of them. I read an article on uh, a news site here the other day about the uh, seven husbands and eight marriages that uh, Elizabeth Taylor had. Well, here we have this. 
This woman answered and said, I have no husband. She said, I know, you've spoken right. You don't have a husband. Oh. Oh, and the man you're with now is not your husband. You've had five of them. So what you've said is true. Well, now this, this is getting her attention. Now, now, now she's being challenged on another plane, on a higher plane here. Now she's being challenged, not just in the way she thinks, but about how she lives, her morals. See? See, in order for Jesus to turn her life around to save her, Christ had to change her thinking. The way that she looked at life and the way she judged life. He had to change her thinking to help change her understanding. That was the only way she was ever going to have life and not die a sinner's death. Do you see the similarities between her and Bertha? Something had to change, something had to change Bertha's thinking to help her understand. And it failed, but Jesus said, no, this doesn't have to be here. Verse 19, the woman said in her, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Now she's beginning to think a little bit more on another plane. She said, our fathers worshiped in this mountain and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. She said to her, woman, listen, believe me, take my word for it. That the hour is coming when not, e not in this mountain and not even in Jerusalem, you're gonna worship the Father. He says something, verse 22, you worship, but you don't know what you're worshiping. You don't understand what you're worshiping. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship. And when he said that, he means the Jews. Why? Because salvation is of the Jews. God's way of salvation is made available uh, through Jesus Christ, who is of the Jews. So it was through the Jewish nation, Israel, that the Messiah would come. And the Samaritans were like in the dark. They were just guessing at what they worshiped. They didn't fully understand this principle. He says, you Samaritans know very little about what you are worshiping, but we Jews do. We know all about him, the Savior, for salvation comes through the Jews. The Samaritans didn't understand what they worshiped, but the Jews did. Folks right here, this is central to all that we do in serving and giving and living for him in our stewardship is what makes my stewardship what it is and have any value is because I place great worth and value in who Jesus Christ is. That's what he's saying is to acknowledge Jesus Christ, his worth and his value. He's the beloved son of the father. It's his honor and his worth to me personally. That's why I can express my love my adoration, my devotion. That's why I'm willing to sacrifice for him. That's what drives me every Sunday to be here in God's house. That's what's driving me to occupy this place and this office. Because Jesus, there came a day when I felt his hand on me and called me into the ministry. Just like Paul, Paul said, I'm amazed that he put his hand on me and called me into the ministry but even more amazed that he would even save me, that he, would, that he would knock me down on the road to Damascus and cause me to go blind and challenge me, why are you kicking against the pricks? Let me tell you what, if Jesus Christ has great worth and value to you, it's not a hard thing to live for him and serve him. And it does not make it a burden for me to be faithful, whether it's giving, whether it's coming, whether it's telling others or living the life out at my work site or in my neighborhood or whatever it involves. It makes life different. It makes it, now I understand what Jesus is, the resources of this living water, what it can mean for me. To see that Jesus is pleased and uplifted and glorified in everything, in my praying and giving my lifestyle, my faithfulness. Folks, that's what worship is. It's from the old English word, worthship. That means I acknowledge the worth of great value of the object that I choose to worship. And he says here later, then he goes on. 
The hour is coming and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Think of Christ's condemnation of the Jews, the Pharisees for their formality. They were great in giving their offerings. They were great in giving their sacrifices. They were great and emphasized keeping the law. But Jesus Christ was sick of it. And he said, I reject it. Why? You're doing this formally, but your heart is far from me. And Isaiah prophesied that very thing. So he says, I want, the, does that mean we don't use tangible, physical, material possessions to honor the Lord and give to him? And No, it's not saying that. We do that. He's just saying, what's motivating you today to be faithful? What motivates you to be involved in the work of the Lord? What motivates you to want to give in the offering? What, what is it that really motivates you? Well, what is of great value? What is your priority? That's what he's trying to get across to this lady. So he says, you want to worship me? You want to come to me? Then it's by spirit and truth. You must worship me in spirit. That is in contrast to material, superficial ways. And you must worship me in truth. That's contrast to falsehood and hypocrisy, carnal, temporal, earthly appetites. Now the woman said unto him, I know that the Messiah is going to come. And he's going to tell us all things. Well, he said, now the coup de grace. He says, well, I'm, I am the one who is speaking to you. I am he. Well, about the time the disciples come. So she leaves her water pot and she heads into Sychar. And she says, you've got to come in here. This guy is telling me everything I've ever done. Isn't that what the Messiah, when he comes, is to do? And they all came out by a, the hordes out of town. They shut down their businesses. They came out to find out. And it says later that many of them, because of the change in this woman's life, the change that came over her, they said, we, we believe because of your testimony. But many of them came out and said, no, it's not because of you. It's because we heard him ourselves, And we made a conscious free will choice to say, I'm going to believe him and I'm going to follow him. And the disciples wanted him to eat meat. See, there they are thinking on the earth. He said, oh, he said, I've had meat. You don't know anything about. That's real stewardship. Real meaningful stewardship, folks, is when I've taken Jesus Christ as my Savior, He owns me. He's my all in all. He's, I'm, I choose to live every day that He's my Lord. Because I place great worth and value. It's never a problem when I was growing up because I could tell through my parents they put a lot of great worth and value in who Jesus was and serving him. And it wasn't hard for me to do that. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know and to experience? I think about some areas of my life where I could have been if it had been for the grace of God. And that's just it right there, folks. <laughs> right there in a nutshell. God reached down and took my life and he changed my thinking. And then he helped me understand, listen, I've given you a rich resource of eternal life. Now don't go hoard it. Don't go put it under lock and key. Why do you turn lights on in your house? Why do you light a torch or a light or a, what, to hide it, to put it under, under the bed? No, you light a light so it can give light to those that need it. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Then Jesus said, then let your light so shine that they may see your good works, but they'll glorify the Father which is in heaven. 
they'll see the worth of who Jesus is to them when they see it in your life and through you. Folks, that's real stewardship, isn't it? That's real stewardship. This is the thing that saved. She got her thinking changed. And she began to understand and look at life different. It saved her. Poor Bertha. If someone would have helped her to understand. Well, now what we need to do is we need to evaluate. I want to ask you three questions. Number one, let me ask you, what are you basing your values on today? You know the challenge of our kids as they get out of high school and they go off to college? Well, okay. Where are your values? What do you base that? What do you base reality on? Your beliefs, see. Your beliefs, those strongly held core values and beliefs. You know, values is from a word that means to be worth something. What is Jesus Christ worth to you? What has worth and merit to you? Something temporal is only for a while. Only for a season, it doesn't deserve our trust because it's not the ultimate reality. Everything about the nation Israel, everything they did, that's why they put in the camp as they traveled in the wilderness, the tabernacle was always in the very center of the entire camp because it represented that everything about the Jewish life, everything, civil life, religious life, family life, whatever it involved, everything revolved around their relationship with God, the God of Israel. So let me ask you, where are your values today? Now let me ask you the second question. Do you understand the purpose of why you're here? I'm not talking about just here today in this service, but I'm talking about here on earth. I'm talking about where you are in life. Do you understand the purpose of why you're here? Folks, in everything, business, work ethics, conduct, character, attitude, we are to bear his likeness. We are to reveal his glory. We are only to point others to Jesus Christ. We're here to advance his kingdom. But let me ask you, do you understand the purpose of why you're here, why he saved you, why he's given you what he's given you? Here's the third question. What is God's purpose and design then personally for me? Regardless of how wicked this world is, regardless of how much they hated the Lord, how they hated Jesus, how they sought to kill him, how they spat on him, they saw him hang on a cross, as, as much as they rejected him, just because they rejected him, Jesus did not choose to cut and run and hide. He chose to face it. When it was time for him to go up to Jerusalem at the beginning of the Passion Week, he set his face like a flint. He knew what he was here for because he understood what God's purpose and design was for him to fulfill. And that's the same. He doesn't want us to go off and hide. He wants us to stand bold, to be his light and salt. He's counting on us. He's given us a rich responsibility and stewardship. He's committed something to our hands. He's counting on us and trusting us with this stewardship. God can more effectively do what he needs to do if I'm yielded to him. I tell you, if we could capture this, these thoughts today, all the stewards that it could make out of us. What a difference in our service. What a difference in our attendance. What a difference in my life, even as a father, as a husband, producing a fruitful life for him. Now you say, okay, how can I get started? It's very simple. Listen to this. It's found earlier in John, John chapter 3. Verse 30, here it is. Here's your answer. He must increase and I must decrease. It's a simple thought. Jesus Christ must become more prominent in your life. He must be, you've got to become little. You've got to become less significant. 
this is what's necessary. Jesus must become more significant and important and greater in my life than me. He becomes greater, I become less important. It's what matters to him. Where's your value in Jesus Christ? You know, we're going to sing a song here. Jesus paid it all. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Do you understand today where your values are? Or are you in Bertha's place? You don't have to stay there. You can be where this woman was in John 4. If you're willing to open your heart and receive what Jesus has said today in his word, would you stand? Every eye bowed and every eye closed.